Um, Toby's been elected a fellow of the Association for the Advancement of AI for his contribution to AI research and has won the prestigious Humboldt Research Award. Toby's new book is Faking It, Artificial Intelligence in a Human World. Now, I thought I'd start with a quick question to the audience. I'm trying to think of the best way to phrase it. How many people in this audience have never tried ChatGPT or Claude? Okay, that gives us a sense of where we're going. Okay, Don't, no shame, no shame. <laughs> but it, it's just super interesting. So, for those people who've never tried these sorts of tools, I thought we'd start with a little test with my trusty tech assistant here. Just hold on a second. I'm going to test out ChatGPT and show you how just one very small iteration of how it works. Good morning, Chat GPT. I'm moderating a panel discussion about AI with two very distinguished experts on the subject. I'm floundering. What should I ask them, especially in the sphere of the artificiality of AI and also in the sphere of gender in relation to AI? All right, well, if you've read the last one, um, good morning. How exciting that you're moderating a panel on AI. Here are some questions to spark discussion on the artificiality of AI. Oh, I mean, it, what's important here is not that you read every word, obviously. What's important here is to show that, I mean, that was a completely one-off question. I hadn't posed it before to ChatGPT. Um, and yet ChatGPT was able to spit out that much information so quickly at such speed it still just blows my, my mind completely so i mean you could ask any question um, i'm having real difficulties with my my dog um, she's vomiting every morning what do i do i mean the, the questions that you can explore with chat gpt are endless and there is a difference between searching the web and you're, you're not encouraged to ask medical advice <laughs> 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 Ask a medical expert, or in that case, a vet. But I don't want to talk about mine, what I know about it. It's, it's, um, it's about these guys. So I thought we'd start with some definitions. First of all, Toby, um, what is AI? And particularly generative AI, because that's what we've, we've heard so much about in the last couple of years. Claude, ChatGPT. Uh, in this book, I do say you don't know how depressing it is to begin... Uh, having to define what you do to so many different people. But the good news is that more and more people are actually starting to understand what AI is because it's starting to have an impact on their lives. Uh, I think lo loosely speaking, it's trying to get computers to do things that when humans do them, we say they require intelligence. So that's being able to understand the world, understand the question that you just typed. That's about reasoning about the world, making decisions, um, and it's about... Um, then acting in the world, which is why AI ends up in robots, which is they're physically acting in the world. But increasingly, we're getting computers to do stuff for us in the world. So it's anything intelligent that AI does. There's a new flavor of AI called generative AI. You see that in, in products like ChatGPT, but also you see it in um, products like Stable Diffusion, where you can type in, I want a photorealistic picture of the Pope in a white puffer jacket, or Trump being arrested by the NYPD, and you get a, it, it generates a new a picture that is indistinguishable from the real thing. I tried to explain to my elderly mother um, when I was on my way here what how this happens, how this works, particularly the generative generative AI. How does that happen? Um, it's connected to <laughs> machine learning, deep learning. What it do is, those words it, mean? It, 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 the easiest way to understand that is to say, when, when you're typing a text, an SMS into your phone, and you get halfway through a word, you type A-P-P, and the phone says, oh, I can finish that word for you, Toby. That's Apple, maybe. Because the most common way of finishing words that begin A-P-P is Apple. In that case, the phone's got a dictionary of words, and there's something about the frequencies of words, and so it knows how to finish the word. What they've done here is they've taken not a dictionary of words, they've taken a large part of the internet, all the text you can find on the internet, all of Wikipedia, um, all of the New York Times, without permission, um, 
lots of thousands of books, including my books, without my permission. Um, and then because it's taken that autocomplete and put it on steroids, it can finish not just the word, it can finish the sentence or the paragraph or even the page. But it's important to realize it's not really understanding the words like you and I understand those words. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, at the end of the day, when we communicate, there's a lot of formula to what we communicate. So we speak often in quite scripted ways. You know, if you're in a call center, you literally have a script. Um, and actually what I take from that is that a lot of human communication isn't as intelligent as we think it is. We don't actually engage our brains as often as we think we do. We're actually often repeating phrases and expressions. Um, and we've taught machines how to do that. And it's very convincing. And a lot of stuff that we do requires you just to do that repetition. Mm. There are two terms I've heard, deep learning and machine learning. First, are they the same thing? No. No, okay. <laughs> uh, second... D deep learning is a special type of machine learning. Right. Well, machine learning... What's machine learning? ...is a large part of artificial intelligence because our intelligence, if you think about it, most of the things that you do, reading, writing, arithmetic, navigating maps, whatever it is, many of the, most of the things that you do that require intelligence are not things that you were born able to do. They were things that you learned to do at school and in life. And so increasingly, the way that we get computers to do things, intelligent, is by teaching them how to do that, and that's machine learning. They learn like you learned how to, to speak French or whatever it was. We, we give them lots of examples, like you were given lots of examples, and the computer learns to do those things. Can you clarify something? Because I've read that you, you've just said that the training data is off the, from the internet, Wikipedia, the New York Times, your book, etc., etc. But I've read that when you do searches in ChatGPT or Claude, it's not pinging the internet for information, is it? So what's the distinction there? It was trained on the in, what's on the internet, but it doesn't actually draw on the internet for searches. Well, it has, in some sense, memorized what it saw. Just like when you learn stuff, you memorize, not completely, you know, you don't remember things, unless you have a photographic memory, but most of us compile what we learn into some sort of memory. And similarly, ChatGPT and Claude, these other systems have memorized, uh, summarized what they've seen on the internet. But on a, in a contemporaneous way, they're not drawing on it every day. Uh, so the very newest generation of tools also are doing a web search and summarizing that. So they, they, the first generation was, was out of date because it was not contemporaneous. But, but now it's as up to date as Google search. Right, got it. When we feed things in, like for example, I, I will confess as a writer, I've experimented with ChatGPT, I've fed in, I've done interviews with real humans and transcribed the interviews using AI. Um, and then I've put sections of some of these transcripts into ChatGPT and said, S can you just structure this in a slightly better way? Now, what comes back is often useful, but I do many, many, many more versions and edit it and so forth. My question on this is, and I'm not doing this for everything I write, by the way, I should add, but my question is, are we, f with the questions and the information we're putting in, are we feeding this beast as well? Does that go into its brain? Of course. <laughs> Did we not learn anything with social media? The, I mean, when the product is free, this is free. You are the product. And where are they getting the contemporaneous data about, about what you like and about your interests is from that. And they keep on changing their, what they admit to the do, but you are sharing that information with them. And possibly, in many cases, they're using that to update the models. Can I ask, I, I was actually going to ask Toby a question as well, which is my understanding as well as obviously the way that you write and structure the prompt changes completely what you get. So the one of the increasing <laughs> levels of expertise that young people are trying to pick up is to become effectively a prompt engineer. So You've got a great line in your book about that. From What was that line that you said about the 12-year-old, the girl, the a friend of your one, the daughter of yes, one of your oh, friends? Yes, who desperately wants to be nice to her toaster. Yes, <laughs> she's, she's c increasingly concerned that if she's not nice to the toaster or any form of technology that it'll be remembered and stored at some point in time. Um, and, and when the machines start to get a little bit narky, she wants to be on their good side. 
<laughs> but, but even if you don't worry that the machines, you need to keep on the good side of the machines for when they're, when they're smarter, there is still that w wonderful conundrum as a parent that you have, which is, you know, should you encourage your children to say please and thank you to Ch ChatGPT? Well, and this is the other interesting question, one that I explore around gender, which is um, if you have a gendered voice, so if, if, if instead of typing, you're actually um, interacting with technology uh, through a male or a female voice. One of the really interesting studies that, um, and we've done in our organisation, we've replicated this study, is that if it's a male voice or a female voice, you will ask it an, a different question um, and you'll make different assumptions about how you should interact with it. So, you know, you, if it was um, give me the 10 best Bob Dylan songs and you're using a female voice um, to interact with, you might say, give me the 10 best Bob Dylan songs of all time. If it's a male voice, oh, can you please give me the 10 best Bob Dylan songs of all time? You'll, you'll ask it in a, in a slightly different tone, but you'll also get a different answer, perhaps, based on whether or not because your prompt is different, um, as a result, uh, the gender interaction will be different. I was going to come to that, yeah. But again, this is how the tech industry is, is fooling us, faking us all the time, which is that there's no reason why they should have gender. They're not, they don't have gender, they're machines. They, they ha lack gender. Uh, we could call them, you know, we don't have to give them female vo names. We could give them names that have no gender. We, we could call them robot or a computer or something that it tells you exactly what they are. And they certainly shouldn't have, you know, there's no reason why they need to speak to us in a female voice or a male voice. They could have a, a voice that has no particular gender, a mechanical voice. But they could, but they'd make a lot less money. Exactly. But, you know, we're the ones being forward at the end of the day. It is. They're, but there's they're also more the person than they are. There's also the phenomenon where, what, whereby any, any if they, and they are these proliferate everywhere now, courses to help people work with AI to learn how to use it. And you're encouraged, and I have, not that I've done one, but I've read, you're encouraged to be very specific in what question you ask. And you say, I'm writing a paper for a university assignment, or I'm writing a, a humorous passage aimed at 12-year-olds. The more specific you are in your request, the better, and I put that in quote marks, your ans the answer is meant to be. Th th that's only a reflection that the technology is still immature. That you and I didn't have to really agree too much about how we talk. I mean, there are social protocols that we've learned over time, but you know, you can have a conversation with someone with very little prompting, very little cueing as to how you say that thing. So it's really I, th the idea that in the, the job of the future is going to be prompt engineer is... is no, no, I, I'm, I'm not... The computers not are going to get better and better, so yes. you have to be less and less specific with yeah. them. They more understand what you say and do what you ask them to mm. do. Um, I'm move, about to move on to talking about some of Carla's fascinating research in her book and fascinating information, but before we do, just a little bit more clarification. The generative AI that we're talking about here, Toby, is just one subset of AI generally, isn't it? Um, in what other sorts of AI are there? Well, there's, there's probably a lot of AI in your life that you don't realise. There was a study done where they res estimated the average person um, touches AI 20 times a day. Without most of, In most of those cases, you probably don't realise. So if you came here and you got directions from your car or you got directions on your phone, that was a little AI that is taking to account the current traffic conditions, the current timetable and, and changes to the timetable, and finding you the quickest way to get from A to B. Um, if you get book recommendations on Amazon, that's a little AI that knows something about the sorts of books that people like, knows a little too much about you and the sorts of books that you've read in the past, and then is making recommendations. If you open up Netflix, Netflix is an AI, people, they don't ad advertise it as, the, uh, Netflix is an AI company. Everything you see on Netflix is chosen for you based upon your previous viewing. The movies that it's recommending, and they do a pretty good job. It's estimated that 80% of the content that people watch on Netflix are not movies that you came to Netflix to watch, but movies that were recommended for you. So there's a, there's a lot of examples of AI already doing hopefully useful stuff in your life that you're probably so not aware of. So when we talk about algorithms dictating what appears in, in our various feeds, yes. is that AI, is an algorithm an AI? A sophisticated algorithm is AI. So most of those algorithms are learning something about you. 
based upon your previous viewing habits. And the funny thing is that people don't realize is that the internet that you see is unique to you. I see a different internet than to you. Even now, we're getting to the point where almost every price that you see on Amazon was chosen for you. It's not, it's not like walking around the shops where everyone gets to see the same prices. What you're willing to pay, what you've paid in the past, determine what the prices they are offering you to, to buy products on Amazon. Well, in, when we, we're talking about what different people Even see on the internet, um, that's very relevant in your mm. sphere, isn't it? Male, what males and females see. But before we ask, I answer, I get you to ask, answer that question, we've talked about the data sets that feed AI. You talk about biased data sets, Carla. Yes. Could you explain what they are? Yeah, so to some extent, um, and Toby's explained that uh, some of the sophisticated generative AI like ChatGPT really just has sucked up all of the internet and written words um, and fed it in. The problem with a lot of that is that to some extent in sucking up all of human history, it's also it's also encompassing all of the bias of human history. So unless you're recalibrating uh, to make sure that that bias is accounted for in the way in which the data is fed in, um, and this could be in any sphere of AI, then you are effectively reinforcing a lot of the discrimination of our history. Uh, and so to some extent, you know, bias in data and particularly gender bias. Uh, so a, an, an easy example of this is even now, um, and I haven't asked it actually most recently, but this, when I was researching this book, I asked ChatGPT4 who scored the most goals um, ever as a, um, uh, as a soccer player in a World Cup, uh, and it gave me Ronaldo. Um, and it's not, it's, um, it's Sinclair who's a female, and she scored double the number of goals that he scored. <laughs> so we're not talking about a small margin. I think his is 100 and something or other, and hers is 200 and something or other. So uh, it, it's very interesting that it's, you know, it's assumed that because the internet has talked so much about Ronaldo and because there's been so much interest in male soccer versus female soccer historically, that as a result the answers that you're going to get, um, the bias you're going to get. And you can do the same in Google. In fact, the first 20 pages will be much more about Ronaldo than they were, will be about Sinclair. Um, so it, it is this notion of, you know, that unless you are constantly calibrating for bias, you're not recreating a future without bias. You're, in fact, reinforcing the bias. It's really scary. Um, one of the most scary things that lines in your book was that um, the new generation that's growing up now might be the first in a long time to have more regressive attitudes to gender equality. That's just extraordinary. I mean, what yeah. sort of things... I mean, can you, yeah. can you break them down, so your key concerns? So this, this is actually... So this comes out of several studies. Um, there was one really big large-scale study that was done in the UK, but even some of the studies that have been replicated in Australia have... Um, most definitely shown very similar results. And they are that, and Toby summarises it perfectly, we see a different version of the internet. Each of us see a different version of the internet. In, in our phones, all of our technology, Netflix, etc., is completely customised to us. But it's also customised to our gender. So, and if gender is one of our single biggest sort of markers of group identity... So if you're marketing, you're marketing based on group identity. Uh, so and that could be socioeconomic identity, it could be where you live, it could be you know what language you speak, it could be all sorts of different forms of identity, but gender identity is being one of the primary ones. So we have one of the first generations growing up that is learning to socialize uh, online um, and acquiring so social skills online, but in a completely um, in, in parallel universes in some senses. So um, that young girls are learning a different version of the world to young boys and they're interacting with technology in a very different way to young boys. So, uh, and I track this through in the book um, and if, I'm, if I can quickly summarise, in some senses it's everything from the fact that, you know, you have... Silicon Valley, which is generally a male-dominated world that is creating online worlds that are very much reflective of um, 
the values of a young man in Silicon Valley. Um, and um, so there is a degree of inbuilt misogyny into that. And then secondly, the group identity issue that we've just spoken about um, is very prevalent. Um, and then thirdly, you know, what technologies young girls use versus what technologies young boys use are completely different. So young girls will tend to be far more uh, prevalent on social media. They will be looking at TikTok, they'll be looking at Instagram, um, they'll be worried about how many likes they're getting based on visual representation. Um, uh, they'll be acutely aware of their visual appearance. Um, young boys will be much more likely to be, if they are on social media, they'll be using different types of social media. So they'll be using uh, uh, YouTube, uh, Reddit, um, but they'll be much more likely to be into gaming. Um, and um, a lot of the games that they will be playing will have gender stereotypes baked into them uh, and, uh, and implied social interactions with characters and avatars within those where the female representations are perhaps uh, skewing their views around gender. And then thirdly, even in terms of their interaction with the digital economy will be completely different. Uh, so one of the interesting parts of research is that young girls are twice as likely to follow a brand online than young boys. Um, and the experience of unboxing and, you know, they will be rewarded for showing a new outfit uh, and the number of likes they get for the new outfit, you know, or the new makeup or the new fake eyelashes, et cetera, uh, will be what drives. So they'll be, they'll be encouraged to have a, a commercial relationship with the internet where they are commercial and they are consumers. For young boys, they're much more likely, in fact, twice as likely, uh, to be doing things like um, micro-investing, buying cryptocurrency, buying land in the sandbox, buying um, uh, items in gaming. Uh, but it will be very much skewed as this form of investment. So their relationship and the way they're being trained is to be trained as investors. So you're, you have young boys trained as investors and young, burly, young girls trained as consumers. And so this is really ha shaping a complete difference in the way in which young boys and young girls um, have a gender identity uh, that is shaped by their online social experiences. And that's before we even get to... <laughs> Can I just interrupt to ask yes. a question of both of you, because I think I know where you want to go. Um, there's a book called The Age of Anxiety yep. by an author called Jonathan Haidt, I think that's how you would pronounce it. And he's basically, I think, saying that kids, and I'm not sure at what mm. age he's cutting kids off at, but they just should not have access to social media at the very least. Um, what are each of your views on that? Well... We have three children who have been told they're not having phones or social media until they're 16 and are extremely disappointed by this. <laughs> but um, we'll probably hold firm on it. Um, Good luck with that. <laughs> oh, I've got some willpower going on. Um, um, the, 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 the pressure, because yeah. all of their peers will be engaging. Well, with, and the problem is this is... This, this, double-edged sword you have you know it's social media so it is you know you hear about the parties and all the gossip through social media you if you if your children don't have access to that then they miss out on that but equally you know it's having this very corrosive effect on especially young girls body image on on anxiety yeah. there's lots of evidence suggests people who use social media are less happier than people who don't and do I you do you have children toby I do have children, yes. She turns 15 tomorrow. So. Does she have access to social media? Unfortunately, she does. Um, I'm not sure that it, it, you know, it, it's been a, a, not a positive thing. I do think we're going to look back. I'm not sure what the, the cutoff age is going to be, but I suspect in 10, 20 years' time, we're going to look back at social media like we look at tobacco and alcohol. Yeah. Young formative minds are uh, we we protect them from the influence of that because we realise that you know it's very powerful stuff, and probably um, you need to be protected from yourself until you are able to take responsibility as, as an adult for yourself. And so we don't let young people smoke. We don't let young people drink. We, we also don't allow, for instance, advertising of alcohol and tobacco yes, on TV. Yes, uh, for, for, those, for those reasons yeah. as well. And I suspect we will look at social media Drinks in 10 or 20 it. years' time and say young formative minds should be protected from 
the harms that social media can bring. Mm -hmm. um, this so the, the greatest, the greatest um, <sighs> mistake we allowed was to allow it to be called social media because it sounds like it's good. Mm. There is so much extraordinary stuff to cover, so I'm going to try and move on. Two areas that you look at quite extensively in your book, Hala, are gaming yep. and porn. Um, oh, some of the word, it's some of the language that comes out. The adult entertainment industry's investment in participatory VR exper sexual experiences, AI-powered sex robots. It's, it's really mind-boggling, but do you want to start with gaming, perhaps, and tell us... <laughs> let, let's leave sex till later. Um, start oh, yeah. with gaming, Look, maybe. I feel like now that you've opened with that, we've got to go with that first. Tisselizes. Um, so, it. yeah, no, I mean, actually, no. Uh, we'll go back to gaming. But also the gender, the gender implications of the, both. The yeah. gender implications of both. No, um, one of the... I uh, actually will... I'll, I'll flip it around the other way, but I'll say that one of the weirdest words I ever had to learn was the word teledildonics, <laughs> um, which I did not know was a concept. <laughs> and no, I did not go out and do real life research for the book, just to be clear. Um, so teledildonics is uh, VR porn where you can have a completely immersive experience. So you have a suit um, or some form of device so that you can replicate all of the uh, sensations that you might experience in online sex. Um, and so this is, this is very much um, uh, pictures the future. Uh, and, um, but it's a future that's kind of been unfolding over uh, many years. And, and I, I start with, in fact, um, uh, going back to sort of chatbots and the relationship with chatbots. And, you know, as we, we've seen how sophisticated, for instance, the answer is from um, ChatGPT4. Um, but there are so many chatbots that are really about, you know, forming relationships uh, and the creation of relationships. And so I think, you know, yes, there is fake porn and yes there is um, non-consensual porn and there's a huge industry around that where children have increasing access to that and not just access to pornography that is um, created in studios but access to fake pornography where they can for instance even get pornography and versions of classmates um, and insert them into a pornographic scene which they can then create online and share around. Um, and so, you know, what that does in terms of the nature of um, social interactions between young people, if that's your first sexual experience is either viewing that or your first sexual experience is, for instance, or your first romantic experience is with a chatbot, what does that mean? So, um, the, I think... The good news there is yesterday the government decided to make that illegal. Yeah, yeah, but whether or not that's actually going to be able to hold, I think, is going to be a really interesting question because, yes, but there are so many ways around so many things yeah. in this world, as you well know. Um, and, um, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I meant, I'm innocent. I meant it in the technology all, all sense. All the I'm, I'm not insinuating you've, you've, you've ventured into teledildonics <laughs> by any means. Um, but, um, but no, I was going to say that um, one, of, one of the other things I, I talk about is that the first person to ever marry a chatbot which is uh, a guy in Japan called Sal9000. He, he wouldn't give his real name, but he was interviewed as to why he decided to marry a chatbot. He said he'd, he dated a number of real girls um, and it just wasn't for him. Um, <laughs> he had dated a number of chatbots before settling on Neme. Um, uh, Neme was fantastic because she was completely adaptive and submissive to him. Um, and served his every need. Uh, and as he changed, Neme seemed to be able to change and accommodate uh, to his needs as well. Uh, so he decided he was going to have a full-scale marriage um, and a ceremony with Neme. They had a honeymoon. He took her to Guam. <laughs> I'm not sure whether or not she got her own seat on the plane. <laughs> uh, or whether Neme was just in the pocket. I'm not... Who knows? Um, but... Um, but it's really interesting how much a human being can form an attachment, an emotional attachment. Um, and I've even had this in, you know, so we, we have a relatively technology-free household, but uh, when my children go across to their grandparents, uh, my, my daughter, who is 
eight was using Siri and she came back and she said, Siri's my friend. And I said, what do you mean Siri's your friend? And she said, I asked Siri, are you my friend? And she said, yes. <laughs> and, I, and I said, okay. She's like, and then I asked, does she love me? And she said, yes. So Siri loves me. And, I'm, and it's this really weird relationship that we have where, you know, human beings, I think, and this is really goes to the heart of... Uh, a, a lot of the, you know, faking it part, you know, which is that human beings, we are so hardwired that to some extent when we see something that looks so real um, and seems like such an engaging interaction that, you know, our brains are automatically fooled into believing it. And there's so much research on this that, you know, our brains change so quickly to form emotional attachments even with things that aren't real if they seem real enough. And I think your new book goes into the metaverse a little bit um, and, and what that might look like. Um, but increasingly, if, if we are moving into a world where there is um, online metaverses, um, so fake worlds created where you get to pick your own avatar and exist within them. Um, so one of the first, um, uh, so I think it was Facebook uh, and it's, is it Deep Horizon? Was Second Life? No, no, it was something or other Horizon. They're f one of their first kind of metaverse. Second Life? No, before that. Uh, their test, their beta test one. Um, so the beta test one they gave uh, to a female engineer um, and she was having a play with it with um, a whole lot of other various different... Um, so they'd given it to uh, a whole range of people to sort of test out the avatars and within sort of seconds uh, her avatar was uh, gang raped by other avatars online. And... Um, and they posted things like, you know, um, photos of it and then, you know, go on, tell us you like it, et cetera. Um, so it was this, it was, and she, she described the experience as though even though it was virtual and even though it was detached from her, um, at the same time, it still felt incredibly real for her. Um, and it still felt, she still felt the emotional impact of it. Um, and I think, you know, that, that becomes part of the question is, you know, how much, for instance, and there's other studies, for instance, that show that if you expose people to an avatar uh, of, um, you know, uh, that is being raped or that is, you know, um, uh, being assaulted or being degraded, a female avatar, how quickly do they normalise that as behaviour? And the answer is extremely quickly. It changes their viewpoints around what is acceptable in terms of social relationships very, very quickly. We've, we've talked about how our relationships in the virtual world and with uh, chatbots are, are being challenged and changed, but it's also worth pointing out that our own relationships with each other are being changed. Most people marry someone they met through a dating app. That are these algorithms, again, that is deciding who you get to see, of the vast pool of people you get to see. It's, a, it's an interesting sociological experiment we're running on the human genotype uh, in real time. That you know, It used to be you would meet people in your immediate circle, people are geographically fell into your orbit. Well, now those constraints have been changed and it's, perhaps it's much more appearance-driven, perhaps it's much more... So whatever the algorithms are choosing, or whatever um, we're, we're clicking on, people are now marrying and then having kids with, and that's deciding our future. All our relationships now are being mediated through these algorithms with each other. It's extraordinary. Um, another question for you, Carla, and then we'll c I, I'd like to come back to some questions for Toby. Given the incredibly um, confronting um, issues that you've shone a light on in your book, and in the context of the current discussion, in Australia at least, about DV and family violence, um, and any number of people are discussing family violence and ways to address it. Do you think, in the light of what you've discovered, that the, um, th that the discussion about how to solve the problem is broad and deep enough in scope? No. <laughs> uh, I hate to give a single word answer, but abs absolutely not. And, and it's interesting because even in that survey, if I look at sort of Generation X versus even the sort of later Millennials versus Gen Z, 
you know, Gen Z and the, the new and emerging group, particularly of young men, um, when asked the question, who should be the dominant or controlling person in a relationship, um, will say the male should be the dominant and controlling person in a relationship and that is natural, right? Whereas if you look at older generations and even they have a higher rate of believing that than, for instance, men who are in the 65-85 category. Um, and that to me is staggering. So, you know, that to me tells us that even on interpersonal relationships, you know, our understanding around gender equality is going backwards, not forwards. Um, and that I find incredibly scary. What would the number one thing, if you could speak to people who are in positions of power looking at DV particularly, I'll come back to some regulatory stuff before we finish, but in, specifically in relation to DV and family violence, what is the number one thing that legislators and, and advocates to protect women should be looking at? Yeah, so, I mean, we work really closely in this space in my day job um, and one of the interesting parts about it is up until really recently everything has been about the real life world as in you know what's happening um in terms of you know how do you how do you mitigate and what strategies do we have around dv um but the digital world has been almost completely ignored so we're taking almost two steps forward in terms of trying to address dv um through actions around sort of um, you know, this is what financial control is. This is, you know, um, this is how we interact with, you know, and build shelters and how we kind of, you know, um, these are the sorts of classes. But the entire digital world is missed. And so we take two steps forward and then sort of three steps backwards by missing the digital realm and particularly in the emerging generation. Uh, and, and we've only got to look at sort of, you know, the increased incidence of things like, you know, choking and, you know, various other forms of kind of, almost normalised behaviour now within youth relationships uh, that are largely driven by um, a lot of the digital content that is being consumed. Thank, thank you. Toby, back to you. One of your... What, what are your biggest concerns about AI? Like, if, if there were four or five headline points for you. I mean, it, the artificiality of it is very much what underlies the message in your book. So I, I, I should say, I, I'm optimistic about how the technologies are going to improve our health care, improve our education. There are some, there's some big upsides, but that doesn't preclude the downsides. I think the, my biggest fear is, th is the way that these technologies are going to deceive us and undermine our trust in our institutions. We seem to be at a very challenging point in our, in our society where we are very distrustful, increasingly distrustful of politicians, of the polit political process, of um, many of our important institutions. And we are about to have AI-generated content, synthetic content, deep fake content, that is going to undermine that even further. We already struggle, you know, we struggle through the pandemic to, to be able to get the scientific message out about the benefits of vaccines and the, and, and the you know, the epidemiology of, of COVID. Uh, amongst all of the untruths and lies that were being spread around. And we, uh, I, I fear that AI-generated content will only make that worse. Can I, um, can I ask Toby a question? Because we were talking about this in the back room before, and I think it's worth sharing with the audience. And I, Toby, I was effectively inquiring to Toby, how far away are we from being able to, for instance, generate content where, for instance, if you have your three close friends that are your trusted friends that you absolutely believe that if they tell you vote this way for a particular reason or, you know, you want to receive a personal call from Trump, um, how far away are we from having AI that can work out what issue in particular might make you vote a certain way and then create a deep fake of either a close personal friend or a politician that can be delivered to you? I think Cambridge Analytica back in the 2016 election was doing um, some of they, that they research. Into what what they that. did was very unsophisticated. I mean, you talk to my friends, you know, behavioural psychologists, they say, oh, it was, you know, remarkable what, what they, how unsophisticated what they did. What you're now going to be able to do, as you suggest, is 
you can have Trump bring you up and have a personal conversation with you and say, oh yeah, you know, I was on the, if you're a golf, golfer, I would say, yes, you know, we have to have a round of golf sometime or whatever it is. And you'll have an interactive conversation with this bot. And if it's a short conversation over a telephone line, you will not be able to tell it from the real thing. I mean, Trump's not a very high bar to reach, I must admit. <laughs> but equally, as, as, as you suggest, it could also be your closest friend. I just need their picture from Facebook. Three seconds of their voice, I can find that on YouTube probably. Or I can ring up their answer phone, I've got three seconds of your voice. Now I can perfectly copy, clone your voice. I can animate that picture and, and I can have a video call or I can post a message on TikTok or whatever it is that's going to reach you um, and say, I'm voting for Trump. You ought to, you know. And this is the reason and it'll be a reason that's based on what it can possibly even determine from yes, the history from that will trigger you. Yes, it will be what, and again, I come back to the internet you see, the message you see will be uniquely tailored for you. Mm -hmm. There'll be ones that think that we think that will trigger you to go off and vote. And, and um, we, you won't see all the other uh, you know, untruths that everyone else is seeing. You'll just see the untruths that seem to work for you. And how do you run a democracy in that? Well, you, you can't. You, you really can't. I mean, the, the democracy requires us to trust and understand the other person. And, and if we're in a world in which nothing you can trust, you, your, your faith, it, it, there's a little bit of me and just... And a shared narrative, a shared, a shared Yes, I mean, you know, a little bit hopes me that social media becomes so full of this stuff that we realise social media is just a place to be entertained. Nothing there can be trusted. If you want to get the news, you've got to go to the ABC, the BBC, CNN, whoever it is you trust for your news, whoever it is can give you what you feel is trusted news and that, that we don't trust. But the problem is most people today, the majority of news arrives now not through the ABC or the old-fashioned media, it arrives through social media. Over 60%. Yes. It seems to me that uh, there is just an uh, extremely urgent case for media literacy and, and AI literacy and digital literacy to be in, uh, yeah, embedded in curriculums. There's an, ev there's an extremely urgent case also to hold the so social media platforms accountable. And we don't... We hold the ABC to very strict standards, you know, <laughs> They say the wrong thing. They have to you know, get publicly humiliated, it seems, at the moment. Um, but we don't hold social media to anything like the same standards at all. They've, they've argued for many years that they are just an intermediary. Well, now, actually, they're not no, just an intermediary. They are the largest source of news. In terms of regulation and government intervention, can I get each of you to talk through what you think that should look like and how that can happen and what the likelihoods of success for that are? Carla, perhaps start. So Toby's probably a better answer at this in some ways because he's, I know that you're on some of the, the panels. But uh, look, I think, it's, I think it's difficult because it is a global problem as well as a local problem. We can make it a local problem, as in we can put in regulations. The EU has attempted to. The US is having discussions around it. Um, but I, I, I think to some extent it, it is an extremely difficult problem to solve because of the proliferation and the individualisation of the technology. Um, that, that would be my view. Um, and my second, my second other view, which... Um, I suppose I want to touch on while we were on topic as well is um, I think there also we need to broaden even the scope of so we're looking at it from the perspective of democracy and generative AI I think even in terms of the impact on the economy as well um, and how do we for instance regulate the use of AI in the workplace and at what point should it replace workers so you know we, we had a union movement at a certain point in time that was really around safety, right? And it was around safety of workers, but it was around pay. And it was around um, how do you have a rebalancing within a capitalist economy um, around, uh, in particular, uh, collective action for the benefit of a workforce. AI um, has enormous disruptive potential within the workforce as well. And so I think we need to see it almost as an industrial issue as well as a democratic and, uh, an issue around sort of uh, the impact in terms of, um, uh, in terms of trust in society and social cohesion. Well, yeah, yes, I do s 
um, sit on the expert advisory committee to the government advising them about how to regulate the space. And I'm actually, actually, I'm a, I think I'm a bit more optimistic than you are. Um, <laughs> In the sense that I think there was a period you know, 10 or 20 years ago where we thought you, you couldn't and you shouldn't regulate the tech space. You couldn't because somehow it was different. It was cross national boundaries, as you say. It was not physical, you know, these bits that, that travel down wires. Um, and that you shouldn't because that was going to stifle innovation, that was going to sti stifle growth. And I think we've actually realized in the last couple of years that you can and you should. Indeed, we must. That actually, that there's now a significant part of our democratic discourse, of our, of our, of our economy, um, and that we've perhaps given the, the tech sector too much, of, uh, too much rope to play with, and some of those behaviors are not aligned with the public good. Uh, and I'm optimistic because I, you know, I look at some, you know, some of the examples. So if we go back to the, the terrible tragedy that happened in Christchurch, that, 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 that terrible uh, incident that happened there, Almost immediately afterwards, here in Australia, we enacted laws to say that to the social media platforms, if divisive, hateful content like that is not taken down quickly enough, we will hold the officers of those companies criminally liable. And do you know what? I mean, it's not been perfect, but they take that content down now a heck of a lot quicker, as far as we can tell, than they used to. So it has, you know, we were able to pass that legislation quite quickly. Um, and it has not a perfect, it has had a material impact upon holding them more responsible. And I think we need, to, we need to do the same. Now, of course, they're lobbying very hard that we don't. They've got lots of money. They employ as many lobbyists now as almost any other sector. Um, those are pressures that we have to push back against. But I, I'm, I'm confident that, you know, there's no reason why we can't. Um, and there's pl plentiful, you know, it's not like... These companies make profits, um, you know, return on revenue, which, are, which is greater than any other business on the planet that is legal. The only other businesses that, that, that can make more money on revenue are illegal. And so they, they, you know, they're making 50% return on their revenue. Um, they sit on vast amounts of money. They have no idea what to spend on. And they've got vast cash mountains that they don't want to repatriate to the US because they otherwise have to pay tax. It's not like they're short of money. Um, if we made it the playing field, we, we had to, you know, this, like, we did the same, you know. We, we, the Industrial Revolution, we had the robber barons, if you won't remember, you know. The, the wealthy industrious were taking too much advantage of the workers and of the, of the monopolies that they were developing in those industries. And, you know, we actually had to push back against that. Unions pushed back that. Uh, government pushed back against that. Uh, we broke up some of the big companies. We will have to do, probably do the same here. We may have to break up some of the big companies. We will have to, we will have to. Unfortunately, the union movement is not as strong as it used to be. No. We will have to push back. But um, you know, I think there's no reason, no fundamental reason why we can't succeed in that, and then ensure that the the benefits are shared by more people, um, by by more of the workers, and that our democracy, which is a very fragile thing, is protected. Um, and indeed, hopefully flourishes. Before I open up for questions, I thought I'd ask each of you to answer one final question. Um, personally, I find what the world, thinking about what the world might look like in 50 years' time, even 40 years' time, absolutely terrifying in, when we're talking about AI and digital technology. And I'm not sure I really want to be around for it. Maybe I'm just a Luddite, I don't know. Um, how do each of you feel about... Uh, do you want to see what this looks like in 50 years' time? Well, I, 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 I'm, I'm too old not to, to suspect I'm going to be alive in 50 years' time, but I, I, that w I would love to be able to peer into that future and know what it looks like. Uh, when people ask me if I'm pessimistic or optimistic, I say both. I'm pessimistic in the short term. We have a tsunami of problems coming our way. Climate emergency, increasing inequality, global insecurity, Europe's back at war. There's just, you know, I think we have to, there aren't many young people in the room, fortunately, because I'd have to apologize to all of them for having gifted them a worse planet. But I'm equally, I'm optimistic in the long term, which is that by embracing technologies like AI, we can learn to live on the planet a bit more sustainably and with greater health and wealth um, that will make ultimately our grandchildren's lives better than ours, just as like our lives 
are better than our grandparents. The and why is that? That was technology that gave us that. Better sanitation, better health care. We live like kings and queens did in the 17th century. Literally, we do. It's easy to forget, but we, our life expectancy is nearly doubled here in Australia. We live to our 80s, not our 40s. Um, and we live um, surrounded by things that previously you required servants for. Um, and I'm hopeful that, you know, if we can get through this bumpy period, our grandchildren can look forward to a world that is equally miraculous, like our lives compared to our grandparents. Carla? I think I sort of have a similar answer, which is that I think it's the great unknown. So I, I don't know what the next 50 years looks like. I, I do agree that there's potential, for instance, for some of the technologies that are being created to do miraculous things that unwind some of the worst things we've done, um, including in the climate <laughs> sphere. Um, well, yeah. potentially. Um, but there is also a huge amount of potential for disruption. I mean, we've, we've built a very fragile global economy. Um, so if you look at it at the moment, um, we have a global economy that's largely underpinned by 750 US bases around the world um, that largely control the shipping lanes that we rely on in order to be able to sort of create a just-in-time uh, process of, um, uh, how do I put it, globalised production. Um, and I think, you know, at the same time, we've got increasing conflict um, uh, in different parts of the world and, and that's always a scary prospect, I think, particularly if you've got young children. Um, I don't know what the technology is going to end up looking like and whether or not we get to a point where we go through, as Toby says, a period of massive disruption followed by a period of prosperity or whether or not, uh, as civilizations have done in times past, we get to a certain point in this civilization where we are jumping off the cliff. I don't know. I don't know what the answer to that is. Um, I'm certainly hoping it's the first and not the latter. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, questions? Yay, lots of questions. Um, I think someone will move around with a microphone. <laughs> um, Thank you. Um, I wanted, you haven't touched on the effect of AI on creativity. I have a granddaughter who, Good question. who does post artwork on a commercial site, Redbubble, and she's really concerned that if she does that, it will be pirated by AI and she will not get the return for her effort. Can you comment on that, please? Your daughter's right to be concerned. Your granddaughter's right to be very concerned. Yes, it is um, outrageous what the tech companies are doing in terms of not respecting authors, artists, musicians, copyright and artistic endeavors and just hoovering it up and stealing it. I don't think that's sustainable. Hopefully we're gonna resolve that just as when Napster started and everyone was stealing music by streaming it, we realized that that was not sustainable. Um, in the long term, I think there is some hope that these, tool, these are tools at the end of the day that will allow us all to be more creative. I'm, I'm a terrible draftsman I can't draw off to save me, but now I have some amazing tools that allow me to be much more artistic than I could be. So every technology that we've invented in the past has ultimately turned out to be used to help make art. I mean, when, when we invented photography, it didn't, it didn't destroy painting, although we now had a perfect way to paint or to capture images with, in photographs. It turned out that you know, painting has actually flourished since then. And indeed, photography now is also there's a part of photography which is artistic, where people use it to make art. And so I hope the same will be true for artificial intelligence, but we have to address those issues, the ones that your granddaughter is rightly worried about, which is how the tech companies is at the moment stealing all of those efforts and, and taking away the, the lifeblood, the support for those people, because that's not sustainable. That will destroy art. The thing that's... Can you hear me? Yeah. The thing that's concerning me at the moment, just very clearly, the ABC has gone to repeats of Antique Roadshow. All the, all the. Um, Do you not like Antique Roadshow? I love it. I love it. <laughs> but I've just had too much. Um, 
but the drum, late line, all the things that we, we need to hear because um, you need some, some ground base of truth in journalism. Journalism is really important for democracy and um, the source that I had is no longer available. And the redundancies that are happening and I think I was reading in that it's to do with meta and um, the number of journalists that have been reduced is terrifying for democracy. Yeah. So also for our livelihood. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I sort of, I, I think the point was made um, previously that, that there could also be, I think Toby, you said this, there could also be a point at which we get so saturated with fake news and with everything fake that we actually really learn to reappreciate investigative journalism and really good journalism again. Um, and if that's the end outcome, you know, I think it's, you know, it's that, that process of coming full circle. I mean, with every period of history of massive technological change, we've gone backwards and then we've gone forwards. Um, so, you know, agriculture, um, life expectancy decreased before it increased again. Um, industrial revolution, um, life expectancy decreased before it increased again. Um, and certainly even quality of life decreased before it increased again. So, you know, are we going to go through a period? And unfortunately, is the period that we're going to live through over the next decades, however long, going to be a decrease in, in quality of life? Um, followed by an increase, and and how fast does that take? Is it is it more exponential, um, or you know, are, are we going to have to lose a generation? The, I mean, it's a, a really important point you raise. I mean, it's not only to the fact that we've now got you know all these alternative places to find content that's taking away some of the audience that, that was supporting those those uh, old fashioned media, but it's also that I'm very aware of. The tech industry has decimated their income. It's taken all the advertising away. Um, and, you know, there was the media bargaining code, but that was voluntary. Um, and now Facebook is saying they're not going to pay that money. So at that point, I think we have to play hardball with them and say, OK, we're going to designate you. You will have to pay that money because quality journalism, the ability to, to, to look at what politicians are doing is really important for the proper functioning of democracy. Well, yeah, because he was a social media president. But this will be the really interesting period because it'll be, I think, the next five to ten years will be whether or not we'll re-enter an era where we're ready for gutsy politicians again. Um, and, and I say that, you know, because to some extent, you know, if I look back in history, you know, it's been a long time since we've had really reformist governments. Um, so do we have governments that are willing to do things like ban TikTok? willing to do things like stand up to social media companies, willing to do things that are, you know, super significant, like, for instance, you know, one of the, one of the easiest things we could do, for instance, from an economic perspective, is say that all of our superannuation, our um, industry superannuation should be reinvested in Australia rather than offshore. Then we'd have a super manufacturing industry um, and our wealth would increase exponentially, you know, at what point are we ready for gutsy governments again? Oh, but unfortunately, again, tech has also contributed to that, which is because the news cycle now is so immediate, so politicians are responding to that. So they, they, they're looking for the soundbite for tomorrow as opposed to investing for five years in the future or ten years in the future. They're thinking about how's this going to fall on the nightly news or how's that going to play in social media? Yes, and I think the question is at the point in which... AI starts to impact the economy and hollows out those middle level jobs. Is that the point at which we start to get a change in attitudes? I, I don't know. I think that's the question. I think we might have time for one more question. Um, does anyone have a question? Lady in the front with the yes, red. Yes, I have a, a question. And oh. I guess it was really around um, one of the things that hasn't been touched on is the merging, I guess, of you know, things like Neuralink and biocomputing, mini brains. So that's also happening right now. And we've got a whole bunch of people who are prepared to sign up for implants of various things. So how do you think that's going to evolve? 
That sounds like an Elon Musk Toby question. <laughs> <laughs> well, Elon Musk's idea is that the only way we can race against the machines is to become one with them, which I think is a, a foolish idea. If you want the machines to understand how silly and stupid we are, connecting ourselves directly to them would give them a very good idea. So, um, again, it's the usual thing with AI. There's some incredibly positive applications. So, people who are para paraplegic, people who have have lost um, use of their limbs will now be reconnected to the world, re be able to have mobility, um, and be able to speak again. Um, so that's a, you know, a very positive use of such technologies. Equally, you do think it could be a very troubled world where you divide into the haves and the have-nots, the haves that have been augmented themselves and have some superior capabilities because they've been able to afford the the links and the others, the have-nots who have been able have to stay as norms or whatever the term becomes. Um, yeah, these are these are questions that are being decided for us. That's the problem. They're not questions where we should be having a um, a societal debate about them because they're not things where Elon Musk or whoever it is in Silicon Valley should be deciding that's the world it should be. I'm going to sneak one more question in, if I'm allowed. The lady in the front in the red. Um, have we got the mic? Oh, I've got the mic. You've got the mic. Just one, one more quick question and then we'll have to. <laughs> uh, no, I was just curious, you mentioned about bias and I'm wondering how do we, what can we do to um, negate that bias? Yeah, so, I mean, one of the things you can do is recalibrate the data. There, there's a, b a bunch of technical ways you can do that. You can either can, can we make people you can do modify it? the data so it doesn't yeah. have oh, the diet, yes. bias. Yes, you can or legally you can make people do it. Yes, yes. You, you could you could regulate it. You could require accreditation um, for the use of a product. So, for instance, um, a good example might be heart attack. So, say we we're using AI as a way of indicating whether or not heart attack was happening. But most of the data we have on heart attacks at the moment is is from male heart attacks, not female heart attacks. They present differently. You could recalibrate the data to make sure that you had a much more even distribution um, in the data set. Um, and in that way, as part of an accreditation process for the use of that product in healthcare, um, you could, for instance, then, um, in effect, uh, make sure that it, it was far more even. But it's also worth pointing out that there are things you can do to mitigate the bias, but there are lots of settings where bias can't be eliminated. You know, the news, so I want my news feed to be unbiased. There is no such thing as an unbiased news feed. Right? I'm seeing only a subset of things that happen in the world. Do I get to see Gaza or not? Do I get to see what's happening in regional uh, Australia or not? I mean, I've only got a limited news feed. I have to make choices as to which things I see in that newsfeed or the algorithms making choices, there are no unbiased choices. You have to make choices. And ultimately, we will be choosing our AI like we choose our newspapers because they align with our values. I think that's a really fascinating point and I'd ask a question except we're out of time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Toby, and Carla as well. That was really amazing. Thank you. Thank you.